Hello again, everybody, and uh, welcome back after a very short break. Um, I'm now I'm just going to uh, give a brief introduction to our research programme from 2017 to 2022 before I hand over to the research programmes. So, um, in 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 that in this recent period, we've been we have been funded for a school core budget, which included the FES programme, which Jenny just told you about, as well as research programmes and theme funding. We also had the addition in the, in the last um, five years of academic research capacity and development and training. And you're going to hear more about that tomorrow morning. So across the last five years, we've had three programmes of research, children, young people and families, public mental health and places and communities, as well as three cross-cutting themes, which you can see down uh, below there, health inequalities, behaviour change at population level and e efficient and equitable public health systems. So what we're going to hear about this more, uh, the rest of the now afternoon um, are from the three research programmes. The themes will be are in the Expo um, area. There's some um, examples of research from them, so please do visit those. Our programme leadership you can see here um, listed, and I won't go through all of the names. You'll be hearing from many of them in the next session um, that have led the, these programmes across the last um, five years and massive thanks to, the, to them. Um, and then also our theme leaders, um, which you can see here too, the photographs of them there. And again, uh, thank my thanks to them for steering these themes um, through the last five years. Um, and the presentations from research themes can be found in the Expo area. Um, so just to, to remind everybody that tomorrow morning we'll be hearing about our academic research capacity development training. But um, before then, now, uh, moving up now, we're going to, um, I'm going to welcome Anthony Laverty um, and um, Steve Cummings, who are going to be speaking on behalf of the Places and Communities programme from the last five years. So I think we're going to have a video and then a live presentation and then there'll be an opportunity for some Q&A. OK, so um, I, I'm now going to pass over the stage and uh, to, and to, to um, yeah, to the uh, first, the first to a video. Thank you very much. Enjoy. This presentation is on the Places and Communities Programme. It's on behalf of all the work package leads, researchers and collaborating st stakeholders across SBHR. And the programme leads are Chris Millett and Esther Vamos of Imperial College, and myself, Matt Egan, at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. The programme is designed to help address one of the big challenges facing public health in England and uh, local authorities since 2010 and probably extending into the future. Uh, and the challenge that we've been asked to address by lots of stakeholders who we consulted was uh, how to deliver public health programmes and activities that reduce health inequalities in the context of lean fiscal environments. The Places and Communities programme aims to provide different kinds of evidence to support decision makers in dealing with this challenge. We've planned to and have reviewed evidence from previous studies, conducted studies of our own primary research comparing local authority health and place strategies and evaluating local initiatives or interventions that could improve health by changing things like local transport or food environments. We've developed resources to help decision makers and work with stakeholders to produce our research we develop and refine research methods to help produce that evidence. We promote capacity building to support the work and we engage in responsive work, notably, uh, especially over the last year and a half, uh, COVID-19 responsive work. The programme is led and coordinated by its programme leads. Uh, we have help from um, operational leads and also our advisory group, public involvement group, and we have a cross programme work package which deals specifically with knowledge exchange. So that's the overall running of the programme. 
Um, the program itself is divided into two main work streams, Workstream A and Workstream B. Workstream A looks uh, specifically at local authority strategies. So at the strategy level for reducing health inequalities, and dealing with uh, the challenge of, of reducing those inequalities when uh, finance and resources are constrained and uncertain. We also have uh, Workstream B, which looks more at uh, specific initiatives and interventions. And within that, we've got two themes, one that focuses in on the food environment and another that focuses in on transport initiatives. We do a lot of capacity building in the program, and this very full screen lists uh, the PhDs, pre-doctoral fellowships, postdoctoral fellowships and internships associated with the program. I'd like to thank all the people who actually did all the work on this program, which is the work package leads and the researchers and uh, uh, in involved stakeholders and public. And I'd like to thank you for listening. Hi, everyone. Can you hear and see me? Can you see these slides? Hi, well, so I'll, I'll kick off. So I'm Anthony Lavery, and so thanks, Matt, for that introduction to the Places and Communities programme. And so this is a going to talk for about 10 minutes about the systematic review, which is still in progress as part of the transport work that Matt has mentioned. And so it's part of this, part of a wider project around road user charging in England. So the background to this is that, as I'm sure everyone is aware, traffic exposure can have significant impacts on health through air pollution and road traffic injuries, among other possible impacts. Broadly speaking, there are two types of schemes. There are low emission zones, which are emission-based restrictions, and there are congestion charging zones, which are restrictions on driving within certain areas, regardless of emissions. A range of places in England have these in operation at the minute, so most prominently London, and other places are considering them. So Manchester is considering a scheme, has been considering one for quite a long time. We do have some supporting evidence around what the health impacts of these things might be. So Public Health England a few years ago had this review of interventions to improve outdoor air quality. And it talked a little bit about these schemes. And also there was a scoping review, which looked at congestion pricing policy and the safety implications. And so that considered road traffic injuries, among other implications such as crime. But the aim of this review was to systematically uh, synthesize the evidence around the impact of both of these types of schemes on physical health outcomes associated with air pollution or traffic exposure, as well as road traffic injuries. So this is sort of getting into the methods of it. So we searched a number of databases. We had independent screening by two reviewers. We assessed quality using the GATE tool for epidemiological studies, and we registered the review as is standard on Prospero. In terms of the intervention, so we were looking specifically at low emission or congestion charging zones. So that means we did exclude some studies where they looked at restrictions, say, for specific events. And so there's some studies looking at things like uh, transport strikes or speed limit zones. And so we didn't include those. In terms of health outcomes, we had this broad categorization of health outcomes that you might consider were impacted by. Anthony, I'm just going to interrupt you one second because uh, whilst we're all listening to what you've got to say, we can't see your slides. 
Oh, I see. And I'm, I, I'm aware that, that you're, you're clicking through. So we're, I think we're missing something. So if it's possible for you to pop your slides up just to where you're speaking, we can make yeah. sure that they, they're shared. Obviously, people can see them. But I didn't want people to miss out. So uh, I'll, I'll withdraw and let you do that. But if you uh, could. Uh, thanks, Ashley. I'm going to try. OK, thank this. you. Sorry make to interrupt. Work. No, that is, that is very helpful. Sorry that we weren't there initially. Um, can you see this? not currently no there's a little share button down at the bottom and then you pick your you should be able to pick your screen and it should come up yes you should be next to settings and then share yes you should in theory be seeing my entire screen which is are you there now I, i'm still here but we can't see your slides no you still can't see the slides no um uh, what about now? This is my uh, third time trying this. See this now? No, unfortunately not, Anthony. Oh, um, do keep clicking on. <laughs> you keep clicking on this share. On your, can you see them on your screen? The share. Yeah. So okay, well, maybe unshare and try again. Yeah. So. You should be able to pick, flick through anything you've got open and put them, and put them. Yes. Up. So it is. I mean, it is telling me. That, um, yeah, it is telling me that you should be able to see them. But. Okay, we've got. Um, Hi, Anthony. Um, just a quick one. If what we're going to do is we might just move on to Steve, and then we'll get your slides sorted, and then you can speak after Steve's video. Yeah. Okay. Steve? yeah thanks for that. Sorry, everyone. Give you time. Good idea. Yeah, okay. Thanks, See you Steve. shortly, Anthony. Thank thanks. You. Thanks. Thanks, Ashley. Thanks, everyone. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Stephen Cummins, uh, and I'm talking to you today on behalf of our wider TFL study team to tell you about our evaluation of the uh, implementation of advertising restrictions on high-fat salt and sugar products on the Transport for London estate. So just to give you some background, the advertisement of high-fat salt and sugar foods and drinks is a key driver of unhealthy food purchasing. In February 2019, the Mayor of London introduced restrictions on the outdoor advertisement of HFSS products across the TFL estate as part of a wider set of policy tools to help combat childhood obesity. The TFL estate accounts for around about 40% of all outdoor advertising in London, so the policy had the effect of significantly reducing population exposure to unhealthy food advertising. It also provided an excellent opportunity to evaluate both impact and implementation of this policy and generate some real-world effectiveness evidence for healthier advertising policies for policy. <clears throat> so, um, as I mentioned earlier, individual food and beverage products were um, targeted for this uh, policy. So adverts with food and beverage products were submitted to TfL and then assessed against the DHSC nutrient profile model. Under this model, which classifies individual food and drinks products as HFSS or not, um, products were classed as HFSS if they score greater than four for foods or greater than one for beverages. As a result, these products could not be advertised if they met that threshold. So this means that um, sugar sweetened beverages, for example, could not be advertised, but it does mean their policy can apply on alternatives such as low or low, or low or very reduced calorie versions of the same drink could be advertised alongside their brands. However, for certain products like chocolate confectionery, where there are no alternates, this meant that both the product and the brand also uh, was, was removed from the TFL estate. The MPM does generate some anomalies, such as the advertisement of fried chicken, for example. So fried chicken has a great deal of, of protein in it, which uh, garners some positive points under the MPM model. So this meant it was policy compliant, despite the fact that you and I would probably popularly consider fried chicken to be an HFSS product. Where, advertising, uh, where an advertiser sorry, believes a product advertisement does not contribute to childhood obesity or HFSS consumption by children, an application could be made to, to a so-called exceptions panel where that product was discussed uh, and then a decision would be made about whether that product could continue to be advertised. And some products were allowed to do that, such as stock cubes and olive oil, uh, which we can reasonably say that did not contribute to childhood obesity. 
So just some examples here. There are some adverts taken from the TFL estate pre-intervention. And so which of these were then um, restricted from the, removed from the TFL estate as a result of the policy? So we can see here that the product advertisement for individual food and ch of individual chocolate and confectionery products was, was removed. We can see brand advertising for chocolate and confectionery was removed. Uh, and we see advertising for the burger was removed. However, the fried chicken advert for the delivery aggregator was still uh, present, as was um, an advert for salad with the delivery aggregator, as well as a meal box company here, which had a relatively healthy meal as a result of the advertising. So there are two main questions for today. <clears throat> what is the impact of the TfL policy on household HFSS food purchasing? And what are the main considerations when implementing the policy for implementers? I'm going to focus mainly on headline evaluation findings. I am happy to answer Meta's questions at the end, or perhaps um, I can supply the published scientific papers uh, for you to read later. So first up, we're going to uh, look at the impact on household purchases of HFSS grocery products. And I'm focusing here on grocery products because this is the main um, tool for our evaluation. So we used a control design here where we compared uh, the effect of the policy in the intervention area, which is London, and compared it with a control with a counterfactual um, generated from a control area, which was the north of England. So at 10 months, um, sorry, um, over the course of the study period, which was 80 weeks, around 5.1 million food drink, foods and drinks were purchased, which of around 2 million of those were HFSS purchases, so around about 40%. And we had data from just under 2,000 households, which were quoted just over to, just to, to purchasing um, uh, products purchased for just over 5,000 uh, people. So at 10 months post-implementation, there was a 6.7% relative reduction in total weekly household purchases of energy from HFSS products. So this equated to a reduction, an average reduction of 1,000 calories per household per week. And this also meant there were reductions in fat purchases, 57.9 grams, saturated fat purchases of 26.4 grams, and sugar purchases of 80 um, just under 81 grams. So you can see here the policy has had a relatively large effect. We also looked at the impact on a five key um, food and drink product um, uh, categories. I'm just going to talk to you a little bit briefly a little bit about um, one of those. So um, our largest falls were observed for chocolate and confectionery with a near 20% relative reduction in total household weekly energy purchases as a result of the policy. So this equates to about 318 calories from chocolate and confectionery per household per week, which meant there were reductions in fat, saturated fat, and nearly 42, 42 grams of sugar. Just to say that we did look at other product categories, as I mentioned, and we found no impacts on sugary drinks, and we found no impact on sugary cereals, and marginal impacts on other, on other uh, product categories. I'll explain a bit why that might be at the end. So as I said, we're also interested in implementation challenges, and we focus on two uh, main sets of implementation challenges, both practical, which I'm going to talk about here, and political, which will be in the next slide. So when it comes to practical considerations, two key things emerge. One, which is get um, engagement with industry. Um, engaging early with industry is really key um, to the policy, to policy success. But there, um, it's fair to say there could have been more time between announcement of the policy and its implementation which was um, just around about three months in the case of this policy. And the communication of any kind of subtle policy changes could be improved, as was the case here. However, it's fair to say that industry very quickly adjusted the policy and it became highly routinized in practice. So policy was very quick to adapt to the policy and it didn't really become a problem. So use of the exceptions panel also became relatively low um, only, and only a few products were really assessed by this panel over time and very few of those were granted an exception. The other key um, issue here is defining junk food. So as I already alluded to earlier, there are strong limitations of the nutrient profile model. It doesn't um, allow policy, certain products which we would properly consider to be HFSS, such as fried chicken. They are deemed to be policy compliant. It doesn't account for things like portion sizes. So you could, for example, um, advertise a bucket of chicken and that would be okay. Um, and also it doesn't really counter for fake foods. So things like polystyrene burgers, which were then used as models in the advertisement of certain types of products. So um, just to say that I think there was a key issue here about independent traders. 
So it can be quite costly for um, companies to develop the nutrient um, uh, information for each individual product to be assessed uh, by TfL. And so independent traders, such as kind of independent curry houses or fish and chip shops, might not have the capacity or the resource to generate nutrient profiles for their own products. So we need to think carefully about how we treat those traders. The exceptions process, which I uh, mentioned earlier, really did facilitate implementation. They were seen by some to run the risk of undermining the nutrient profile model. And there were particular challenges for food delivery platforms and kind of model foods, as I just mentioned. And the consistent application of policy is key. And there are also political considerations when it comes to implementation. There needs to be maintained the public perception this is common sense policy, and it's a really important concern for policymakers. And it must pass the so-called reasonableness test to avoid any kind of public backlash. So public perceptions of the policy and efforts to maintain public support were an important concern for the mayor in this policy. And there was definitely a tension between public health and protecting commercial revenue as a key interest in monitoring any financial impact of the policy on advertising revenue for TfL. Industry did express some frustrations with the perceived influence of political motivations and policy, and implements did have some concerns about science being overshadowed or weakened due to lobbying. And there's also, I think, fair to say, navigation of reputational concerns. So would there be a public backlash, negative press, particularly around the time of re-elections? Um, would there be tensions with this policy between local policy and then what national government wants to do? So overall, I've got a couple of key messages that come out of this study. <clears throat> so the policy reduced average household weekly purchases of energy by a thousand, which is over a thousand calories per household per week. In this study, this equates to a reduction of purchased energy of just over 385 calories per person per week. For products with policy compliant alternatives, such as low or zero calorie drinks, brand appetite continued. And this might explain why we observe no impact on SSBs. And so it indicates the importance of restrictions on brand as well as product advertising and optimizing policy effectiveness. There's one big caveat here, that there are secular increases in nature possessed purchases over time in our study um, sample which meant the intervention was effective in reducing growth of HFSS purchases, but did not reduce absolute HFSS purchases. So key messages too around about implementation. So development, design, and implementation of the policy was influenced by both practical and political factors, including the definitions of junk food and engagement with industry and navigating putative impacts on revenue and supporting business. And also there was the issue of maintaining reputation and the political tensions. So in conclusion, restricting the outdoor advertisement of HFSS products is effective in reducing purchase of energy and nutrients from HFSS products. And in context, our findings show that the observed effects here are larger than that for the UK sugary drinks industry, that'd be for sugar reduction, which is widely considered to be a very successful policy. Benefits are more likely to accrue to more disadvantaged households, potentially, I've not reported that data here, but that's true, and therefore may help reduce health inequalities. And that implementation study suggests policy is highly feasible and can be successfully delivered by local government. Our supporting evidence will publish and open access. And I just want to thank the School of Public Health Research for funding this and the wider study team. I'll take any questions. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, sorry about the mix up with the slides, uh, but I think you see me now. And so Katie is about to show the slides and then kind of a very so quick overview of the rest of this presentation. Perfect. Thanks, Katie. So just to recap, so we have this systematic review of low emission zone schemes and congestion charging schemes. The broad aim is look at the health impacts, both road traffic injuries and uh, sort of this wide bucket of things that you might consider to be caused by uh, air pollution, so cardiovascular diseases and their birth outcomes and then their lung cancer and diabetes. Crucially, we restricted to just longitudinal studies, so we didn't include only cross-sectional studies. And we also only included studies with empirically measured health data. And that's because some studies had predicted essentially what was going to happen to air pollution with the implementation of schemes and then fit a sort of a percentage reduction, say, in heart attack. And so we didn't include those studies just based on sort of predictions of what might happen. So we can go to the next slide, please. 
So in terms of what we what we find, we find about 3,200 studies that uh, filtered down to about 57 studies we looked at in full text. Uh, we kicked about 40 of those out to end up with 17 studies at the end. Two of those studies were identified by searching the references of the initial 15 studies that we find. So go to the next slide. And so how it, how it breaks down is shown really in this slide. So there's, there's nine studies looking at low emission zones. So these were predominant, most of these were in Germany and the UK and Japan. And so these tended to look at these air quality related outcomes, cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease. The congestion charging studies, there were eight of those. And so those tended to be based in London on the London congestion charge with one study in Sweden. And these very much focused on road traffic injuries. In terms of design of the studies, they were mainly difference in different studies or interrupted time series studies. So really, you know, really a focus on natural experimental designs in the studies used. Next slide, please. So this is, I appreciate this is a little bit, there's quite a lot to take in in these next few results slides. But so this is our harvest plot of what we find across this slide is low emission zones. So down the left hand side there, you've got the outcome and each bar is a study and it has the reference number in there. The height of the study is the quality assessment, how good did we rate the study as being. And because different studies, so if you imagine a study looking at broadly at cardiovascular disease, it might have total cardiovascular disease, then it might have say hypertension and it might have heart attacks, so different studies can be represented more than once here. So we try to display what you get across the whole picture of outcomes. Uh, there's no increase of an increase in any of these outcomes post implementing low emission zones. And so if you think, if you look there at cardiovascular disease, you know, reasonably convincing evidence five studies that all say there's some type of reduction in cardiovascular disease post implementation. But also two studies across subgroups that find no real effects. So a bit of a variable picture, and you get a variable picture of some of the other outcomes. If you go to the next slide, please. And so the next slide gives a bit of a sense of the sort of size of effects we're looking at here. So you've got you know, one study found a minus two, you know, minus two percent reduction in cardiovascular disease. There's a minus five percent reduction in hypertension. And so these are the sort of the size of effects we're talking about. So they're they're modest, but they are they're not huge, but they're not completely insignificant. If you go to the next slide, the next slide shows that across across diabetes and a few other outcomes, we just we have sort of one individual one or two individual studies. Again, there's nothing to suggest that these schemes are increasing health risks, but a bit of a variable picture. So the next slide shows what we have across uh, congestion charging schemes. And so this slide, again, is a little bit messy because with the predominant focus on road traffic injuries, things are broken down by severity of injury and mode of travel. But again, um, it's a, a positive picture in terms of so six out of the seven studies, they are clear reduction in total injuries or injuries caused by car. But there is one one study, one single study that finds an increase in cycling and motorcycling industry injuries after implementation of these schemes. And then to the next slide, which is the final, the final result slide, shows again the sort of size of impacts we're looking at here. So between two and seven percent, uh, mainly in terms of reduction, but one study to find a whopping 37 percent reduction in road traffic injuries just in the month after implementation. And so the next slide please. Uh, so just in conclusion, uh, so this, this work is still going on, but I would say, you know, the evidence says low emission zones can reduce some health outcomes related to air pollution. The evidence around cardiovascular disease is stronger than for other outcomes. And we haven't looked at specifically what is causing this. So is it air pollution? Is it something else? We don't know. And the London congestion charging scheme has reduced overall and car road traffic injuries. Potentially some increases across different categories, across different subcategories of mode, but we um, aren't, haven't quite 
uh, I haven't quite got to the bottom of you know how we're gonna how we're gonna interpret that, but it looks like you know that is a sort of a subgroup analysis. Um, and the generalizability is that what would happen if we implemented this in other cities is still unclear. And so next slide, please. Uh, so yeah, thanks for listening. Thanks to SPHR for funding this, and thanks to the co-authors. And hopefully, we're on time for any questions people have. Oh, so um, so I'm happy, yes, I'm happy to take uh, any questions. I think Steve, Steve is just still arriving, uh, but I'm happy to take any questions if anyone has them about the systematic review on congestion charging and low emission zones. Oh, and so yes, yeah, so if people could put those in the comments if they have any any questions or things they want to discuss. And I mean, I suppose I would say broadly, I mean, one thing about the about the systematic review is we, you know, we've tried to focus specifically on the sort of the health the health outcomes. And there's you know probably less fewer studies than they would expect around actually you know what you know what are the empirically measured health health outcomes of these things. So I'd say I mean, definitely that is a surprise. So Steve is also here with some fancy pictures in the background. Um, So Steve having some connection problems, but so we just got to the end, Steve. We'll see if anyone had any questions in the comments. It um, doesn't look like anyone does have any questions, but your connection has improved. Oh, I'm sorry. So, uh, sorry, I, yeah, I can see a couple of questions here. So first from Ashley about the potential to reduce inequalities um, <clears throat> um, and, and about the delay in the in the current uh, watershed advertising. So I think I've said before on a couple of occasions that um, the, the really positive thing about the TFL um, policy is it can be done by local authorities. It doesn't need national regulation. It doesn't need national policy to do it. So it's a decision for local authorities to kind of take control of that and and implement it within their own jurisdictions if there is the will and the, possi uh, and the legal possibility to do it. So I think, you know, even though I think we are, as a public health community, fairly disappointed in, in the delays of occurring, there is some positive steps that can be taken. And actually this policy can be can be done without um, without kind of national government oversight in some respects. So obviously there are the politics associated with that as well. And, and I see here there's a, a question from Susan Jones as well about expanding on keeping the public on board by ensuring schemes reasonable. And I think, just to answer that quickly, I think really important here is communication. I mean, if there are any um, colleagues from the GLA in the audience that might be able to kind of better answer that question than me. But I think, you know, having really positive media about the policy, ensuring that you talk about it in a way that, uh, it, that it affects kind of your children's health as opposed to your own health makes a big difference. Uh, and then do lots of consultation um, and think really carefully about the messaging, about it not being a punitive measure, but one that's kind of supportive, really, really makes a difference in terms of the public acceptability. And actually, some some, some of the evidence from the GLA um, uh, itself you know, shows that the public is pretty supportive of these kinds of interventions, actually. Uh, and actually, they're very, very, relatively well supportive of um, kind of population level interventions generally. So I think there is a will to do this kind of work and there is uh, an understanding from the public that these kinds of things are possible and undesirable in some cases. So but it, it is about understanding your local context and how your kind of your local community thinks about that. But co early consultation is key, I think. Uh, so, thanks, yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> Go, oh, yeah. go, go I just got, yeah, so I mean, there's a, a few questions that I chat about the, uh, this is like review, and I mean, just on that, so someone has asked about whether we had sort of like subgroup, of, you know, whether we detected subgroup effects, and so there's quite a limited amount of information in the papers we found about, you know, impacts across SES, um, or anything you might consider like that. Someone did have a scoping review a few years ago, which sort of looked broadly at the impact of these things, so sort of like transport and other things impacts but so there's definitely not as much as we would hope around sort of health um, and, just, and then so richard has a question about 
how many studies looked at specific mediators to allow us to say, you know, this impact is caused by air pollution. Probably about half of the studies which looked at cardiovascular disease and those outcomes did have some mention of air pollution, but a lot of those studies didn't have it in there. And I guess there's a whole range of evidence around the impact on air pollution, which doesn't take that next step sort of empirical health outcomes. So, you know, I guess in terms of findings, this work is going to, you know, hope to bring all of that together in a nice case. Thanks, Anthony. There's a question here from um, Sarah Thackeray on behalf of Jennifer Bostock. Um, actually, the, the mayor and the TFO did not do their own <laughs> evaluation of the impact of the policy. Uh, they left it to us. And I think we were quite clear at the start to make sure this is an independently funded evaluation because it adds weight um, if it is if that's the case. And I, and I think you know, all credit to them. Um, I did prepare them at the very start of the evaluation to say that, you know, in general, I thought this policy probably would have, you know, relatively small effects and minimal effects, and there is a reputational risk associated with that. Um, but they kind of stuck with um, allowing us um, to con continue this. And I think, actually, it's, it's, it's been very beneficial. Um, so just to say that they their own internal work is really focused on one of the key concerns from kind of industry and from the mayor's office itself about the impacts on revenue. Uh, and we didn't look at that. But actually, the, the TFL um, policy uh, showed that they didn't lose any revenue as a result of that. And that's kind of key concern, particularly with the dire financial straits that the transfer London is at the moment. That was a key thing. It had to be a net zero cost policy. And in fact, that is the case. And um, just to say that the revenue has slightly increased. Obviously, you know, it might not have increased as much as it might have done in the past, but there's been no net negative economic benefit um, for, for the local authority, which is kind of really good. And then the second he question here from Mackenzie Fong as well about fruit and vegetable advertising. Um, short answer is I don't know. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not sure what the evidence is for positive advertising and its effects on purchase behaviour. Um, I think maybe someone else in the audience might have answered that, but uh, it's it's perfectly plausible, I think. But um, in this case, given most of kind of excess discretionary calories come from HFSS foods, I think you're more likely to have an effect with restricting here rather than kind of more positive advertising around healthier diets. Oh, and we've got um, a, a, a late breaking question from Jennifer Bostock. Did we look uh, outside the... Um, oh, so, yeah, so we... So I guess we didn't look specifically at, you know, these sort of spillover effects, you know, in terms of like just outside outside the boundary. So some of the some of the studies we looked at did include that, and so they used... And so, I mean, one thing that's, I suppose, makes synthesising this a little bit difficult is that you know some studies they've used multiple comparison groups and so but they've reported what's happened inside the zone and they've compared that say just outside the zone and compared the different cities. But so we yeah so we don't have an assessment specifically of what you know what happens in these spillover areas mainly because you know there isn't there isn't a, a wealth of primary studies which have examined that. But it's that it's definitely as you say it's a, a concern and something that people are interested in. And I'm yeah, and I'm I've just seen the final bit. Of it. I'm not, I'm not to be honest, amazingly sure if anyone is looking into that. I mean, I know sort of people like James Woodcock are working up some pretty granular transport and health models for sort of different cities uh, with you know really spatially granular data down to the street level. So I imagine that is something they are thinking about. But I'm I'm not sure if anyone else in the audience knows more about that than I do. Okay, many thanks to Anthony and to Steve and also to Matt for his um, introduction to the Places and Communities uh, programme. Thanks to everybody for the speakers and great, great reco recovery, Anthony. Well, well, well done. Um, we, 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 we got there. So I hope uh, everybody enjoyed the, the insight to those two really important pieces of work. Um, and now I'm going to, we're going to move on um, to talk about our public mental health 
uh, program. So our public mental health program was um, led by uh, Judy Kidger and and uh, by David um, Osborne. Um, and we've got some examples uh, coming up of some of the work from those programs, uh, from that, that particular program, public mental health, with an opportunity again at the end for some live Q&A. So get your questions ready, prefix by Q, um, and uh, we'll look forward to um, to that session after after some presentations. Uh, thank you. Hi everybody, it's uh, David Osborne here from um, UCL, one of the co-leads for the Public Mental Health Programme. I'm going to give you a very quick recap of the elements of the programme before two presentations uh, giving you a bit more depth. So just as a reminder, you can see the other two leads, Kate and Judy on the left there. And obviously our main overarching aim was to deliver some high quality evidence to improve mental health, but across the life course. So if you remember in the first phase of our um, program, um, we aimed to deliver four work packages and they've all delivered with um, our conceptual framework, um, identifying a core public mental health outcome set looking at the mental health of young people in educational settings and also looking at interventions for people experiencing psychosocial stresses and life transitions. So we're very pleased that the conceptual framework for public mental health um, is out there as having influence and you're going to hear more about that later on in the presentation but the website is up there on the slide. And of course the core outcome set led, led by colleagues in Sheffield um, um, has looked at public mental health outcomes in a range of domains, which you can see in the center of this slide. And then we had work looking at um, a variety of aspects of young people's mental health, including LGBT youngsters, and also work around COVID. And once again, you're gonna hear more about that later today. And the final part of our phase one was a variety of reviews looking at what evidence exists out there for interventions to improve public mental health. So we're delighted that there are um, a range of manuscripts published now in um, working age adults, also in ethnic minority populations, as well as older adults, um, and also mapping of local policy and practice across England to identify public mental health. Um, interventions and of course they all fed into designing phase two of our program. So moving on to phase two which started October 2020 so I have to mention of course all of this work's continued through the pandemic and we've been focusing on promising interventions again for adults, older people as well as young people. So as a reminder the phase two projects were divided into those for adults and older people and then there was also work focusing on schools and young people. Um, within the adult population, we had two projects looking at co-located services for people um, uh, who were working age or who were older adults. So delighted that colleagues from across the school led different um, work packages here. And then we had um, a project that worked with our efficient and equitable public health systems theme um, looking at public mental health interventions, um, what we called a big data package using big national primary care data to look at time trends in people with um, people developing common mental um, disorders. And then very pleased to have a public um, um, patient involvement um, element with a project led from up by our colleagues from a pin and you're going to hear about that later too. So regarding the children and young people, we had two projects really looking at school culture and its impact on student mental health, um, as well as uh, looking at young people's motivations for using substances in the context of mental health. Um, and then finally, of course, the creation of a network to characterise and improve adolescent mental health and wellbeing, the Southwest School Health Research Network. We really felt that we learned so much through the programme about public involvement and what that meant in public mental health, working with colleagues at the McPin Foundation. Um, this slide just summarises some of the various um, uh, initiatives that we had and some of the outputs 
you're going to hear from Gillian Samuel later on with a bit more detail about some of the ways that we approach PPI and what we've learned. And finally, just to mention our huge public mental health network that's been set up through the programme. We've got nearly 300 members. I can't believe we've had 17 newsletters and news bursts over the two years. Um, we recently held our second virtual um, symposium with really impressive range of registrants coming along and a very diverse set of talks. Um, so the network um, hopefully continues um, to sign up. There's a link down there at the bottom of the slide. So just to finish with a thank you to everyone who's been involved, who supported the, uh, the programme and um, hopefully I've kept the time. This conceptual framework for public mental health brings together evidence from academic research, reports, and practitioner and public consultations with the aim to map out the factors that affect mental health across all stages of a person's life and provide key information that is relevant and useful to members of the public, public health practitioners, and academics across England, including links to key evidence and lived experiences. This tool can be used to inform policy and practice, advance people's knowledge of mental health and how it can be improved, and help identify further opportunities for research. The content of the conceptual framework for public mental health was produced by bringing together findings from three sources. First, published academic literature on the determinants and frameworks of public mental health which was comprehensively reviewed and summarized. Next, reports and policies identified through scoping reviews and collaborator input. And finally, public and practitioner perspectives were obtained through stakeholder involvement, including mind mapping exercises with peer researchers from across England, which generated determinants that had not been identified through the literature searches, followed by workshops, an online survey and additional consultations. With the state-of-the-art review, the grey literature review and the mind maps, we arrived at three lists of determinants. We compared these, looked at the overlaps, similarities and differences, and then we synthesized them to obtain a list of 68 determinants. We presented these at prioritization workshops with members of the public, public health practitioners, and academics, and we arrived at a list of 48 items. We then conducted a Delphi survey to further consolidate this list and explore the importance of each factor. From these activities, a final list of 55 determinants of public mental health was established. We organized these into four domains, individual, family, community, and structural. With the agreed final list of determinants, we conducted rapid scoping reviews to define each determinant and identify key literature and resources for each one, including lived experiences. We also wanted to highlight the interconnection between determinants, so we focused on summarizing key connections linking determinants from across the framework. Many months of work, I'm delighted to share the final conceptual framework. You can see here the landing page, which has been beautifully pictured by our design team. If you click to enter, you can then explore the framework in more detail. The first homepage here is the four levels. So that's individual, family, community, and structural. You can see it depicted visually as well, where we have the individual embedded within family, community, and broader structural factors. Within each level, there are a number of different groups and determinants. So for example, we have the sociodemographic, group, which includes income, housing, education, and employment. We also have life experiences and opportunities, trauma and adversity, physical and psychological health, personal traits, and identity. 
Within each of these groups, you can go to the individual determinants. So for example, if we were to go to migration, you'll see what is included on each of the determinant cards. So we have a brief definition of each determinant and an indication of whether it's a risk or protective factor or sometimes both. We will have links to key interventions and literature as well as links to helpful resources. Over here, we have wonderful lived experience perspectives. These include videos or blog posts of people who've experienced this particular factor and talk about how it's impacted their mental health. One of the really important things that we wanted to capture to some degree in this framework is how interconnected and interdependent the various determinants are. Migration is not the sole thing that would be impacting someone's mental health. There are a number of other factors, including social or cultural norms, displacement, life transitions, ethnicity and culture, or experiences of trauma. So we wanted to include these shortcuts so that you can quickly go to other topics that are related to the determinant that you're exploring. So if I were to go to one of these determinants, we have hopped all the way to the structural level and thinking structurally about discrimination and stigma. And again, it has all of the same aspects on this determinant card, including the definition, key links, lived experience perspectives, and connected determinants. If you were to scroll down on any of the determinants, you can see some additional information, which includes some literature around the link from that particular determinant to mental health outcomes, as well as some key references. If at any point during exploration you want to go back, you can go up to the group level or the level, or you can go all the way back home to continue your exploration. If there's something very specific that you're looking for and you want to just really quickly jump to that and you're not sure which level it would be organized under, uh, we do have an alphabetized index. So you can quickly see where different factors may fall and so that you can quickly navigate to that place in the framework. Since we have launched a conceptual framework for public mental health last October, nearly a thousand different people from 42 different countries have used the tool for an average duration of eight minutes. We have also received a number of comments from a range of stakeholders, including public health practitioners, academics, and members of the public. Hi, I'm Judy Kidger, one of the co-leads of the Public Mental Health Programme. A large part of our public mental health programme has focused on children and young people and I'm going to highlight three projects that focused in particular on the role of school culture in secondary schools and how this can influence mental health. Our first study looked at using pupil voice to improve school culture. Specifically, we looked at the feasibility and effectiveness of using a participatory action research approach. PAR seeks to enable action by involving study participants as co-researchers. And these co-researchers reflect on what they would like to change, plan and act to create change, observe the impact of those changes, and reflect on what further change is needed in a cyclical process. We worked in partnership with a local mental health charity to implement PAR in three schools. The charity provided facilitators to run the groups and the study team undertook a qualitative evaluation of how well it worked as a method. Staff and student participants found taking part in PAR to be a positive experience. Not only did they feel they created positive change to the wider school culture, but these quotes from our interviews also suggest that being part of the group was a positive intervention in itself. And this may be because we worked with schools at the start to try and ensure the participants were students who may feel more marginalised in other areas of life and who don't always have a voice. 
The mental health charity facilitators also had the view that this project had made a difference for the schools and students who took part. And we'll hear from one of these now. So I think what went well was that despite the challenges that they spoke about, they did, the group did an amazing job of actually identifying stuff that they wanted to change and then actually doing, you know, kind of doing stuff about it, taking action, um, you know, despite all the difficulties with COVID and all the pressures that you get through your A-levels. They, they made it through a couple of kind of cycles round of, of, the, um, of the sort of act, ref, observe, reflect, plan cycle that you were talking about earlier. Um, yeah, that's why I say Roman. I think my impression was that it, it can make a difference. Uh, and I think probably in the context of the school, the people you've just been hearing from, I think it probably did make, it did begin to make a difference. And I think we'll hopefully carry on making a difference because the, the students were, were really motivated to kind of carry on with the work they'd started after the official PAR project ended and pass that on to to the years below them so there's a kind of continuum um, being set up. I think it, it was successful also in the sense it led to some really important conversations about mental health um, in relation to things, things around you know, diversity. For example, we had uh, a conversation where a member of the group was, was sort of explaining how you know, we've been talking about the pressures of exams and, and some students have been saying they wanted, they felt that there should be more space in their in their sort of timetable to, you know, to kind of to sort of unwind a little bit and less you just just kind of less pressure on sort of meritocratic approach we have in our education system around exams. Moving on to our second study, the aim was to help identify support which may facilitate the building of a positive secondary school culture and protect student mental health, particularly in the wake of school closures during the pandemic. First, we undertook a rapid review of literature and discussed our focus and approach with a range of stakeholders, including the public and young people. This was followed by fieldwork in which we conducted in-depth interviews, focus groups and documentary analysis in two contrasting schools. We found that there was a complex mix of factors that influence school culture and student mental health, but three key areas that schools might want to address to create a more positive culture are the tension between academic achievement and student well-being, and that definitely had echoes from what um, our practice facilitator was just talking about. Improving the ways that schools identify and respond to student mental health need, and the importance of attending to staff well-being and understanding the links between student and staff mental health. We hope that by providing detailed individualised reports to the schools that were involved, we can enable them to highlight changes that they might want to make to be more supportive of mental health. Our final study looked at how to make the secondary school context more inclusive and supportive of LGBTQ plus students' mental health. And this study began with a realist review of the literature and a realist approach creates context, mechanism and outcome groupings to help us understand how an intervention or a change might have an effect. And we used the findings of the review to inform the development of a programme theory which showed there are multiple causal pathways within schools whereby poor mental health could be reduced for LGBTQ plus young people. We followed this up with field work, so we undertook interviews with young people and relevant staff in schools, and we used our findings to refine our programme theory. So this is the final theory, and all the context, mechanism and outcomes are captured in this model. But to summarise, there were three broad causal pathways identified that were important. So the first was interventions for talking and support developed safety and coping strategies for LGBTQ plus young people. Secondly, interventions that promote LGBTQ plus visibility facilitate what we're calling usualising, belonging and recognition. And thirdly, interventions that focus on a positive school culture overall create belonging, empowerment, recognition and safety. So the final pathway in particular very much aligned with the findings from the PAR study that a focus on a positive school culture can be an important way to empower pupils and create an inclusive community, which has implications for improving mental health. These are our outputs across all three studies. 
We hope we have and will continue to reach a range of audiences, including academics, practitioners and public with our learning. The PAR toolkit is under development, but we hope that this in particular can extend the impact of that study by providing a practical guide for other schools to try this approach to make positive changes. Thanks very much for listening. Hello. I'm Gillian Samuel, the Public Involvement Coordinator and Peer Researcher. This presentation will be looking at public involvement throughout the programme. It will include insights into our strategy, how our team work together and reflections on our practice. It will highlight some of the key learnings, impacts and changes which took place over time. Next slide. Step one, the partnership between us and UCL built on previous work that we have done with the programme leads, namely Kate and David. This was an advantage as there was already a shared understanding on how to deliver public involvement work in research. Step two, the first challenge was to build a team of peer researchers with diverse life experiences and an interest in public mental health research. We gathered a team of seven people. This, together with their connections in wider communities, meant that we could develop a public network essential for the programme, as well as doing detailed work drawing on different aspects of peer researcher identity, such as genders, race, geography and class. Step three. We embedded our involvement practice into the structures and research projects across the programme. We believe that in doing so, this would bring lived experience and the voice of the public into the heart of research. Next slide. Our team instinctively knew it would be a huge challenge to understand and to work both within and across the vastness of the public mental health programme. It was essential that we supported each other and to do this, we spent time getting to know each other. This was done with care and sensitivity, allowing each other to disclose as much or as little about our lived experiences as we felt we wanted to. We developed some work principles based on respect and held peerness days to strengthen our bond. This camaraderie proved essential as we met with the challenges of the work we would look to each other for guidance and support. Next slide. Our peer research involvement in phase one rapidly developed. For example, before long, we had a presence in programme-wide meetings and in all the work packages. This gave us the opportunity to contribute to help shape the research. We co-led public consultations and workshops and co-created programme outputs such as blogs, posters and papers. Our team built the website I Am Public Mental Health through which the public benefited by having their voices heard. This was especially impactful during the pandemic via the COVID Life Project. By co-creating the conceptual framework, public health practitioners now have the chance to benefit by accessing this via the SPHR website. This in turn will support policy prioritization and development. Here's Ollie with some reflections. Hi, my name's Ollie and um, I really enjoyed my time working on the public mental health program. Um, I took part in many of the larger meetings, part of the program, um, contributing my own views and representing the public in those discussions. Um, I really enjoyed the I Am Public Mental Health project where I helped out with the blog um, in getting the views of the public out there and the artwork of our team um, distributed and um, I'm really excited to see how the, the project evolves over time. At the end of phase one, our team wrote a report from which key learnings were identified and shared. This led to changes in phase two. For example, peer researchers became involved right from the onset of work packages, 
enabling us to co-produce all aspects of research. Our team was challenged by a change in membership and by the pandemic. Not being able to meet face to face was a limitation, but we were able to successfully lead a work package, resulting in the shift of our role to peer leadership, allowing us to operate with greater autonomy. We co-created a buddy system to bring together in pairs, peer researchers and university based academics. Together, they shared information and knowledge, which has resulted in closing the gap. Next slide. Our peer research team led a qualitative study using photo voice. This has involved a team of lived experiences researchers doing in-depth interviews with 30 residents in Lambeth or Harrow. Here is Sandra talking about our work and how we used our peer experiences. Also sharing a bit of our own lived experience have prompted the participants to explore more of their own story, particularly when the topic might be too personal or the participant might be reluctant to bring it out. As a peer researcher, hearing some of the inequalities and the impact it had on the participants own mental well-being triggered my own emotions too. At times it made me feel uncomfortable but what got me through was having another peer researcher during the interview and knowing that there is support in place for me if I need it immediately after conducting the interview. The co-production approach is indeed bearing fruit. It has ensured a high impact across all the areas of the programme on quality, relevance and inclusivity of work. This is reflected in how PPI has become a central focus. We have broadened participation of the public who are now in conversations on how to shape the body of research moving into SPHR3. On reflection, we have progressed from the humble beginnings of a small team to embedding and extending public involvement. Next slide. Here are the different ways that you can keep in touch. Thank you. Hello everyone, I think that we are now live <laughs> and welcome any questions or comments that you have about the public mental health program in general or any of the specific research projects that we conducted. Um, just while we wait for the questions to come in, I, we can quickly introduce ourselves. Uh, so my name is Dr. Jen Dykeshorn and I'm at UCL and I was the program manager for the last three years of the public mental health program. I'm Judy Kidger. Um, I was one of the co-leads of the Public Mental Health Programme and um, worked particularly on the children and young people's school-based studies. Hi, I'm Gillian Samuel, the Public Involvement Coordinator and Peer Researcher working with the McPin Foundation and I've been involved working on the Public Mental Health Programme for three years now. There's some nice comments to you, Gillian, about the great presentation from the public mm -hmm. involvement team. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Just lots of really nice comments, which is always <laughs> nice to see. So thank you, Elizabeth and everyone. Picking up on one of the comments from the overview that David had presented at the beginning, um, the network is going to be continuing. So into the next phase, which is great. Uh, so really building on that success. And uh, I don't know, Judy, if you want to talk in, oh, there's there's some questions. Yay, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, so thanks. We have a question from Sarah about the school's work. Um, so yeah, I mean, um, the really nice thing, obviously it was a small scale study that we did around the participatory action research, just to speak to that one. Um, 
But what was really nice was I think seeing how much the students got from taking part in the groups, there was a definite desire that they were going to kind of hand the baton over. Um, some of the students were, were moving through exams at the time the study finished, so they probably wouldn't be carrying on the group themselves. But um, because they felt it was so important, particularly as a way of bringing in young people who perhaps don't always get a voice in school, um, there was a really kind of nice drive, I think, in those schools that did take part to keep that going. And we've produced um, a toolkit, which I think I mentioned, which we're hoping to share more widely with other schools who might want to make similar changes to their culture. And I see we have a data question, which I will take. Um, we have a question about using Office for National Statistics, well-being, uh, questions around life satisfaction, anxiety. So um, really great questions. In the first phase of our program, in addition to the conceptual framework that you saw, we also had a work package that focused on a core outcome set. And so that uh, report and publications are still in the works and they will be coming. But one of the core domains was focusing on how do we capture and measure well-being at a population level? How would we be able to measure it if pop if public mental health was increasing or decreasing. So using things like the ONS data uh, is really important. And then in the second phase of research, um, I am one of the co-leads of the what's called the big data package, where we're trying to use these previously collected data to get a good picture of what's happening in the population. So this includes using ONS data, also using some cohort data like understanding society, and also primary care data as well from the electronic health records. So lots of measurement. And again, those pieces of work are still in progress and will be forthcoming in the next couple of months, hopefully. <clears throat> Jillian, I see we have a several yeah. great PPI okay, questions. Okay, I'm just reading, um, so it's nice to hear about. Yeah, um, just commenting on um, June's comment, actually. Yeah, it took some time, I think, from the early stages of our involvement to becoming more of a central focus. Um, but we worked closely together and both my colleagues the, in the academic side of the program and the peer researchers worked very hard and we were able to sort of really fuse where, well, certainly in phase two. So moving on to Emma. Emma has asked uh, for any examples of research projects that have arisen from the buddy system. Um, well, the buddy system is quite a new concept and the purpose of the buddy system is really to um, provide a sharing of knowledge and support for individual university based academics on the programme with the peer, research peer researchers individually to sort of share knowledge and experience and to get to know each other's processes of working so that um, people can work together more effectively and that we can become more embedded in the research itself. Um, as a team, sort of, sort of apart from the buddying, as a team of peer researchers, our roles as individuals were to work within each of the research projects across the whole of the public mental health program, which we have more or less successfully done, I would say. Um, I hope that goes some way to answer your question, Emma. I would actually like to add on to your answer as well. It, I think it's, it's really important not to understate the amount of work that the PPI team did within themselves to create an environment where it, where everyone felt supported. And we had really wonderful members of that team for that. But then also, I think there was a lot of work on the academic research side to try and shift that the culture a little bit. So I don't think all of us are used to working in a really collaborative, co-produced way. So there were some difficult conversations that we had to be willing to have and to like, actually respond to and ask for feedback from our public involvement stakeholders in order to actually make sure that the work that we're doing and the ways that we're doing our work are more accessible for people that want to be involved in the research. So I would say it was a very, um, it was a very intensive process, but I'm really pleased with uh, what we've been able to achieve together. Yeah, likewise. Thank you so much, Jen. Um, 
Ashley uh, has asked what advice I would give to people who might be thinking about getting involved in research. And just very briefly, I say, I would say to people, don't hold back. Be proud of your lived experience. Um, come along be, and be prepared if you want to, to disclose some of your lived experiences, but don't feel that you have to either. I think that's a really important because there is a sensitivity to that which everyone respects. Be prepared to learn something new every day um, and to also bring other skills that you have along with your lived experience if you're thinking about getting involved because everything counts, your work experience, your education, all the volunteering you may have done, it all counts. I think we're just wrapping up in a moment and Ashley, I think will be joining us, but thank you so much for your comments and questions and uh, we'd be very happy to uh, chat more. Thank you. thank you very much. Thanks, Jen, Judy and Gillian um, for a great, a great session. Um, and um, I think that being prepared to learn and learn from each other and what we can learn from um, from each other, all of us, is, it was a very, very, very uh, great advice, Gillian. And when we're looking for, for someone to advertise and, and try and get more people involved in our research, we'll, we'll look to you. So, so thank you, uh, thank you all. Uh, we're gonna move on um, now and to um, the, the third of our programmes um, in, in the current work. Just to remind everybody that I think Jen alluded to that some of the work within these programmes is still ongoing because it, it won't finish until um, September. So um, we're, we're presenting some projects that have finished and others that are still uh, waiting to get their final their final results. So um, we're moving on now to um, our Children, Young People and Families uh, programme. Um, and um, that was led uh, by Ruth Kipping and David Taylor Robinson. Um, and there's going to be some um, presentations now about that programme with some examples of the research from that. And again, a Q&A at the end of that. So um, uh, well, welcome to our Children, Young People and Families programme. Hello, I'm Ruth Kipping from the University of Bristol. And I will be introducing this session, which is focused on the Children, Young People and Families programme. The programme has had two overarching aims. Firstly, how can we design better systems to improve child health and reduce inequalities at a local level? And secondly, how can we promote better mental health and wellbeing for children and young people, including a focus on school based systems and interventions? We've done this through studies which have focused on investigation of national and local policies, harnessing data to explain causes of inequalities, mapping the child health system and investigating how the new integrated care systems are focusing on children and understanding the child and young people's voice through a focus on their understanding of inequalities and developing a new school health research network in southwest England. Addressing inequalities has been at the heart of all our work. Through the programme, we have worked with different communities to develop research priorities and evolve them in case studies, generation of child health system maps, engaging young people in understanding health inequalities and establishing new networks, including a network of schools. We've developed the evidence base for public health in England through our publications, conferences and webinars. And we've sought to influence practice and provision, commissioning and health policy at local, regional, national and international levels, including local authorities through the chief medical officer, parliamentary committees, Westminster Policy Forum and WHO. Today in this session, we will be presenting the work from the programme to draw together our research through harnessing data. Look out for the three calls to action from David. Then we will hear from the integrated care system work and how they're developing in the place of children within them. Finally, we will hear from Emma Rigby from the Association for Young People, whose work with young people through this programme has created a toolkit which will be launched this summer. In the session tomorrow, 
afternoon, you can hear more about the PHSE lesson resources about health inequalities, which the PSHE Association and Association for Young People's Health have developed through our work with young people. And finally, tomorrow, watch out for the animation young people involved in the research have developed with Nifty Fox, highlighting their priorities for change to reduce health inequalities. Following these presentations, there'll be a panel Q&A, so please be ready to share your questions or comments in the chat during the panel. Finally, we'd like to thank the cast of thousands who have contributed to this work. Children, young people and families, stakeholders and partners, many academic and professional service colleagues. And thank you to the NIHR for funding the work. First, we will hear from David. Hi there, ISM. I'm going to talk about some of the work we've we've done in the children's program, particularly UCL, Imperial and Lilac, about harnessing data to improve uh, child health inequalities. So we're interested in how we can design better systems to improve child health and reduce inequalities. We, we have poor child health outcomes, relatively speaking, in the UK. Uh, it's, it's difficult to put a positive spin on the numbers. We, we lag behind other wealthy countries when it comes to international rankings. You could choose many metrics to illustrate this. This plot shows under five mortality against relative child poverty. We have the highest under five mortality in, in Western Europe. And what, one of the reasons we do bad, relatively badly on average is because poor children fare badly in the UK and, we, we, and there are inequalities. This plot shows social gradients in children's outcomes at age seven in millennium. Uh, we were interested in explaining some of these social gradients. So we're going to look at asthma uh, in, in a second. So th this is about understanding pathways and mechanisms that generate inequalities. And, and broadly speaking, we're interested in how we break this in intergenerational uh, cycle of social disadvantage where adult social and health disadvantage in one generation affects children's early years outcomes, development, etc., affecting the health of the next generation. So we looked at asthma, uh, which affects over a million children in the UK. It's the commonest chronic uh, disease in children. And we're towards the bottom of the league for asthma deaths in young people. In this analysis, we wanted to know how and when inequalities in asthma were generated. And what we were interested in how is using Millennium Cohort Study, how social factors affect the patterning of risk factors for asthma and how that goes on to influence uh, risk of developing long-term asthma. This is, a, this is a DAG, a causal diagram. First of all, let's look at the relationship between social disadvantage and risk factors for asthma measured in the first three years of life. I'll show you a number of these plots. They show a similar thing. This is prevalence of smoking in pregnancy against a measure of disadvantage. You see a stark social gradient. The same for uh, exposure to environmental tobacco smoke, for not being breastfed as a baby, for damp housing. And in this School for Public Health Research Analysis, we, we show that disadvantaged kids are almost twice as likely to develop the type of chronic asthma in adolescence that we know transmits into adulthood. And we show that about two thirds of that excess risk is actually explained by perinatal and environmental factors experienced in the first few years of life, focusing efforts to address inequalities in asthma on the early years. A lot of the work we've done has been about looking at trends and variations and understanding patterns over time, uh, particularly inequalities. We've looked at hospital admissions and A&E attendances. A&E attendances in kids have been going up uh, year on year, and there's large geographical uh, variation in children's emergency hospital use. Uh, a 60-fold variation in A&E &E attendance. Uh, you can see this further illustrated by geographical region for children under uh, the age of, for infants, for A&E attendances and, and hospital admissions. 
And to explain these patterns of service hospital usage, uh, colleagues at UCL have, have undertaken a, a large data linkage project, linking mother and baby data within hospital episode statistics. And, we, and we, we can use that to look at the impact of maternal factors on risk of children's a and &E attendance or, or hospital admission. So this, this plot shows the relationship between gestational age at birth and risk of a and &E attendance or hospital admission and, and deprivation. And I guess in, in this analysis, we show that maternal factors are important but there's huge unexplained variation uh, at a local level in A&E attendance and also emergency hospital admission that needs, uh, that we needs further research. Extending this work, uh, there's been linkage of ONS birth registration data to hospital uh, episode statistics data for almost 4 million children to create a longitudinal cohort. And, and that data, those data have been used to look at the relationship between the intersection between uh, maternal migration, so uh, maternal uh, region of birth, uh, whether that's within the UK or in countries outside of the UK, and the intersection with social disadvantage. So what this plot shows is the rate of emergency hospital admissions by a measure of deprivation, by maternal, excuse me, by maternal origin. And what you see actually is that the steepest social gradient is for uh, children of UK born mothers. Uh, it's less pronounced in children uh, whose mothers were born outside of the UK. And we've used this type of analysis to look at emergency hospital admissions, also uh, planned hospital admissions, where you see a slightly different pattern but a clear relationship with levels of deprivation and this linked data set is, is being used at the moment to look at a range of different types of hospital admission this shows planned admissions for uh, dental caries children having their teeth extracted you can see the steep social gradient uh, and we can look at the intersection of uh, maternal migration and childhood deprivation we've looked at uh, trends in infant mortality this plot shows infant mortality by deprivation over time, showing an increase in infant mortality in the most disadvantaged areas. In our analyses, we've shown the relationship of this trend and rising child poverty. The trend is clearly related to increased levels of child poverty, but colleagues have also shown that it's related to the coding uh, and, and of especially of uh, preterm babies. Uh, and that the rise in infant mortality has occurred particularly in babies born between 23 and 24, so very extremely uh, preterm babies. What's going on with children in the care system? We've tried to explain this precipitous rise in children taken into care in England. This, the next plot shows rates of children going into care by deprivation quintile, you're more likely to go into care in the most disadvantaged areas, and inequalities have been increasing over time. And in a, in a num series of analyses undertaken uh, across the school, we've tested the hypothesis that austerity measures leading to rising child poverty and cuts to local authority budgets have influenced these trends, and indeed, both those pathways are in play. We show particularly that rising child poverty has been a major driver of children ending up in the care system, contributing to uh, 10,000 extra children ending up uh, in care. We've looked at patterns of investment for children and collated this data in the place-based longitudinal data resource, showing that, showing that spending on children in the decade prior to the pandemic, there was a large increase in spending on looked after children at the same time as cuts to prevention for early years services. And we actually show that cuts to early years services have contributed, especially youth, young people services, have contributed to children ending up in care. And this evidence has featured recently in the uh, independent care review, which came, came out just last week. 
We've looked further at the impact of cuts to things like Sure Start. This shows uh, cuts cut per head over time, showing cuts to early years prevention, particularly in disadvantaged areas. What's been the impact of that? Well, we show that it's 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 affected inequalities in obesity in children age five and and later. This plot shows obesity prevalence by year, uh, by deprivation quintile in local authorities in England, showing that pre-2010, obesity was coming down a little bit in the most disadvantaged areas, but there's been a reversal of that trend. And in this analysis, we show that cuts to sure start have contributed, have had a causal effect on uh, levels of obesity. And because the cuts were bigger in disadvantaged areas, uh, these cuts have contributed to inequalities in childhood obesity. And this, this adds to uh, other evidence that's shown the positive impact of early investment in reducing hospital admissions, improving child development, uh, maybe influencing children ending up in the care system and obesity. Other work across the school has assessed the, uh, the uptake of the daily mile intervention, uh, an intervention in schools where children run a mile, uh, and it's been, it's been taken up to a greater extent in more disadvantaged areas, so proportionate to need. And that's led to work that's ongoing at the moment to look at the impact of the daily mile on children's, on other health outcomes, uh, mental health, uh, and educational uh, uh, attainments as part of the improved study. Pulling this together, what we're going to do about some of these challenges? Well, I'd argue that the, me the real meaning of levelling up is around earlier investment and at scale investment in children. If you want a pithy summary of what we need to do, uh, we need to act early, act on time, act together. We need to reduce poverty and invest more in the early years for children. And our, the programme of research that we've undertaken has, has influenced a range of national and international and, and local policies. Clearly, there's a lot to be done to improve child health and implement the findings across numerous uh, reports and inequalities reports that we've been involved with across the collaboration. But we're, I would argue that, that investing in children, that's, that's the real meaning of, of, of levelling up across this country. Thank you for listening. Hello, everyone. My name is Evgenia Stepanova, and I will be presenting a high-level summary of research and engagement activities undertaken by Work Package 5 team. We've explored integrated care systems for children and young people. This work takes place against the backdrop of NHS reorganization through integrated care systems, also known as ICSs. We carried out a fact-finding survey in summer 2021, completed by 91% of all ICSs. This generated a number of findings Principally, progress towards being a fully functional ICS for children and young people varied widely between ICSs. COVID had a significant impact on ICS progress. Children and young people priorities reported highlighted the importance across ICSs of key health and well-being conditions or markers. We then carried out in-depth interviews with key stakeholders in a diverse sample of ICSs to explore in more details key topics for the development of ICSs for children and young people. 25 hours of interviews were carried out and an early analysis has identified five emerging themes. While there have been and continue to be challenges, there is a strong feeling that children and young people issues are of increasing importance to ICSs. Alongside the primary research on ICSs, we've also carried out two rapid reviews to contextualize our findings within the wider international literature on integrated care. The first review focused on identifying key components of children and young people integrated care systems. Many components are universal, observed across health conditions and settings. For example, staff training, shared responsibilities, empowerment, 
of service users. We've also carried out a review to identify instruments available to measure integration within children and young people health systems, which could be used in future evaluations. We assessed 15 instruments, mostly questionnaires completed by professionals and measuring a variety of integration outcomes. This review highlighted a range of measures available depending on the aims and settings of the assessment. However, more work is needed in developing more standardized measures of integration. Early public involvement and engagement work shaped our research methods and processes, and we are now moving into activities where young people will be involved in the data analysis and interpretation of findings, along with the development of dissemination outputs. Alongside public and engagement activities, we have worked closely with professional stakeholders to ensure that the research is relevant to the NHS landscape and to feedback and contextualize early project findings. All data collection has been completed and we are now writing up results for publication and carrying out further engagement activities. A key message from this project is that integration is a process that is in its infancy and it will require continued evaluation over the long term. Thank you very much for your attention. Hello everyone, my name is Emma Rigby and I'm Chief Executive of the Association for Young People's Health. We are a charity that works across the UK focused specifically on the health and well-being needs of 10 to 25 year olds. I'm here to talk to you a little bit about the work we did co-producing a young people's toolkit, working with researchers from the School for Public Health Research. And this was on a project particularly focused on understanding health inequalities from young people's perspectives. And on the right there, you can see the front cover of the toolkit, uh, which is entitled A Fair and Equal Opportunity to Enjoy Good Health and will be released a little bit later this summer. So firstly, I want to tell you about the process that we went through to create the toolkit. So really importantly, firstly, the, the content is really based on the research findings and we had worked with the research team throughout the project and were able to get a summary of those research findings um, and think about the particular sections that would be developed as part of the toolkit. And we took those findings to a series of toolkit content workshops. We ran those workshops in the three geographical areas that the research had taken place in with three groups of young people who had been involved in the research. And the purpose of those workshops was really to take um, a particular aspect of the research findings and decide um, what were the important things to highlight in the toolkit. And that wasn't necessarily about young people saying these are the things I think is really important um, or it wasn't about um, prioritising the issues that had come from the research, but more thinking through the messages and the issues which um, they felt that other young people didn't often hear about and should therefore be prioritised within um, a youth led and youth developed toolkit. The other thing that we did is we created four youth informed characters and you can see the pictures of those characters on the top left of your screen um, and the idea there is that these are the voices that um, talk young people through the toolkit um, and, and bring together some of the particular issues that the research highlighted. So Ash there in the cap talks particularly about um, a story around feeling safe in um, their community and the importance of their youth centre to um, safe and, um, and good activities for young people in their area. And Michael on the right there is focused particularly with him and in friends are particularly thinking about access to affordable and healthy food in their area and they um, are looking at working with their school to look at how they can improve things. 
And then finally, we took those um, characters and the particular issues that young people have prioritised to a series of co-production meetings. And this was with young people and researchers. So we had two or three young people from each of the areas supported by their youth workers and then working with researchers. And we facilitated those meetings. And there the purpose was to refine the content for the toolkit, think about the look and feel of the toolkit um, and make sure that um, there was a real co-produced sense of the final product um, which has been signed off by that group. So what is in the toolkit? So on the left here, you can see the sections of the toolkit. It covers things like um, young people's rights in relation to health, but also the issues that were highlighted in the research that were important for health um, and important for a fair and equal opportunity to enjoy good health. And it also includes sections about ideas for supporting positive change and um, ideas for young people about how they can plan what they want to do um, and the particular action that they might want to take on these kinds of issues. And then on the right there you can see the youth centre and also a school and this is really important because it's highlighted throughout the research and in the toolkit that there are places uh, that particularly support young people to take action around some of these issues um, and also support their health and well-being. So the youth centres were really important to young people and also were highlighted in the research and are, are core to the stories that you will find in the toolkit. Um, but schools are also really important and places where young people are often talking about these issues and um, as well as the toolkit there are a series of lesson plans which I know you'll be hearing about um, in order to find an another way to have these conversations um, in a school setting. So that is it from me. You can find more about the toolkit and the work of the Association for Young People's Health from us and our email, website and Twitter details are there. And thank you very much. Great. Well, welcome to the panel discussion. Um, I'm Ruth Kipping. I'm Associate Professor of Public Health at the University of Bristol and co-led this programme with David. David Ted Robinson is Professor of Public Health and Policy at the University of Liverpool and part of LILAC and was co-lead as well. And we have Russell Viner, who's Professor of Adolescent Health at UCL, and Hannah Fairbrother, who is, sen who is Senior Lecturer in Public Health at Sheffield University. So please do put in the chat any questions you've got or comments. Um, I'm just going to kick off by um, asking Hannah, who led the work with young people that we've just been hearing about in the toolkit. Um, Hannah, can you tell us what were the headline findings from the project exploring young people's perspectives of health inequalities? Thanks, Ruth. Yeah, overall, young people showed a really nuanced understanding of the relationship between socioeconomic circumstances and health. And they described key factors um, that they thought linked socioeconomic position and health, particularly in relation to abilities to eat healthily, access health promoting environments and activities, and also housing. They also taught quite a lot about um, regional inequalities in both health and wealth, both in terms of a north-south divide and also in terms of more local area inequalities. And they also talked about intergenerational inequalities, which was very much linked to that understanding of regional inequality. So they talked about differences in employment opportunities and income levels between different areas. And I think pervading all the discussions was a real focus on the importance of poverty and how that linked up with different aspects of inequalities in their everyday lives. Thanks a lot, Hannah. So we've got two questions connected to the toolkit. The first one is, is there any plan to evaluate it? And secondly, have you shared it with schools and what has the response been? Thank you. Yeah, I thought we might be asked about evaluation. <laughs> well, we haven't got any current plans to evaluate the toolkit, but I am hoping there might be a possibility through the impact acceleration funding potentially to do that. Um, we'll be hearing more about the PSE 
PSHE lesson resources in the Children and Young People session tomorrow because the toolkit actually links in with some lesson resources that have been developed for Key Stage 3, 4 and 5. And I know the PSHE Association will be monitoring how much those lesson resources are used and getting some feedback on them as part of their work. Thanks a lot, Hannah. That's great. So, um, David, turning to you, um, lots of lovely comments um, about the breadth of work and, and pre presenting all of that, which is great. You've made Zoe Marshman's day talking about dental caries, so that's wonderful. Um, could you just kind of reflect a bit about this work and the work of the School of Public Health Research? What do you feel are the kind of implications for OHID and for the Inequalities White Paper? Thank, thanks, Ruth. Ruth, and it, yeah, it's great. It's great to be able to talk about this large body of work that's that's been undertaken. You know, I I, I guess we're you know we're all waiting with bated breath for for what will come in in the white paper. From the work that's been done, we. We kind of know a lot. John Nicol outlined at the start, you know, the, the challenge to the school. What what are the big influences? Let's let's think about the big influences. And when it comes to children, it's clear that there's very good evidence through a period of when child privacy has gone down and we've invested heavily in the children's system. And then we've seen this evidence, which we've generated, uh, that's shown what happens when you disinvest and when rise when when child poverty. Uh, rises. Those, those are mass effects on children's health and they explain why we have such poor child health in the UK. They explain uh, poor adult health and, and you know, they drive differences in economic productivity. And I guess, you know, a key message is that the, the, solving this problem is out with one particular sector. It can't all fall to health. You know, you can't just think about investing in a particular part of the system well, there are policies moving in the opposite direction in another part of the system. So I think, you know, joint, we're, we're, we're hoping for a joined up uh, solution to addressing health inequalities. You know, and at the centre of it has to be children's rights, focusing on uh, protecting young chil children and young people from, from the impacts of poverty, which starts with providing families in, enough income. So that kids here in Liverpool, are, you know, the big challenge locally is thinking about holiday hunger at the moment, food banks and what's going to happen during the holidays for kids that aren't going to be fed when they when the schools close. Thanks very much, David. And um, Russell, um, we're a week away from CCGs airing integrated care boards being the new kids on the block. Um, so from the research that you've been doing, looking particularly at where children are within these new systems, how should they be prioritising, what should they prioritise to really optimise child health going forward in future years? Thanks Ruth, yes, um, so the, the integrated care system has become statutory on the 1st of July as you were saying. Um, I think the other bits of the work that's been presented um, give us a very strong message about where they should focus. Um, early years, and um, early years, inequalities, obesity and mental health. And I think you'll be pleased to know that actually most of them are on target with those priorities. So that's, uh, that's reassuring. We are studying an evolving system. I mean, much of the data shows that children are in a pretty marginal place in um, the thinking of ICSs. Um, we knew that. That's why in many senses, many, many of us have worked over time to get children into a greater place. Uh, within integrated care systems. Integrated care systems largely started with care of, of the elderly um, and a focus on um, um, incredibly busy ED uh, emergency departments. I, I think the key things for emerging ICSs are to get a strong leadership for children and young people and that's both clinical leadership that's hugely important within the clinical professions but also uh, non-clinical, managerial, whichever, we need champions. There is, There will be a statutory duty for them to focus on children, but we all know how easy that is to be sidestepped or just focused on safeguarding. Um, so we absolutely need people championing um, children, young people, using the data that um, many of the projects and some of the data, that, uh, particularly the data on inequalities that David has shown, to, to think carefully about the populations in their ICSs. But we potentially have a delivery model to make some of those changes happen 
um, in, a, in, a, in a sort of more rapid sense than we have in the past. Thanks very much. And David, there's a question for you from Ashley. I don't know if you can see that in the comments, which is reflecting on the TfL work Steve Cummins presented. What actions can and should local government take to rise to your challenge to act early? Look, I mean, I, I th I'd give a shout out to, to the systems map that you were involved with, Ruth, which, you know, again, makes the point that we, we need that, as Russell's said the you know the governance domain and, and getting that leadership for children and young people correct is is incredibly you know important obviously we need to in invest you know you, we need to invest in the services part of that you know there are i guess there are there are challenges around showing return on investment so i think in sbhr3 you know we are thinking about how we can make that very strong economic argument but clearly what what we're seeing is that Social inequality drives all sorts of adverse early years outcomes, including very, very high levels of hospital admissions in disadvantaged kids. And, you know, these early investments probably, uh, you know, pay, pay for themselves. You know, the, the work that Steve and colleagues uh, has done is, is, is really great. And obviously we should be protecting children from the adverse impacts of, you know, of, 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 of advertising and, to, you know, all those all those things that we know are really important vectors of of social inequality but for me you know it's it's also what can we do at a local level about child poverty you know how can the whole system you know can we provide kids locally free school meals extend childcare all all of these things which are essentially poverty proofing at a at a city level or at a hospital level or at a school level and that those are the types of things that innovative local authorities are, are thinking about and, and integrated care systems. That's great. And um, I think we're almost out of time. Um, I see Ash is just joining us. So um, maybe in the chat, David and Russell, if you could respond to Susan's question about what we can learn from the Netherlands. But I think, Ashley, we will probably sign off there and hand back to you. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Ruth, Russell, Hannah and, and David for a really fantastic session and uh, Q&A session too. Um, and yes, we we can and we should um, extend um, all of those all of those uh, services. So some challenges there from um, from David and from everybody else on the on the panel. Now, we're now going to move into um, to talk a, a little bit more and show you more from our affairs program, the public health um, uh, the, our, our public public health practice evaluation. Um, it's, it, scheme um, and you'll have heard from uh, Jenny earlier on that we had the number of projects that we funded through this both within the first five years but extended and further projects funded over the last five years so what we're going to do is hear from four of those projects there are more in the um, in the um, expo area too but we're going to hear from four of those and then following that there will be a Q&A session uh, from those from those project presenters so um, um, over to Fez, please. Thank you. Hi, my name is Liam Spencer and I'm a researcher based at the Population Health Sciences Institute at Newcastle University. I was a co-applicant and I'm one of the researchers working on this Fez study, which is an evaluation of the Best Start in Life Alliance in South Tyneside. Hi, my name is Anna Christie, the Public Health Knowledge and Intelligence Lead at South Tyneside Council. The school's Public Health Practitioner Evaluation Scheme presented an ideal opportunity for the public health team. There was a lot of innovative work which they have been involved in, and this scheme was a chance for it to be externally evaluated, as well as an opportunity to share our learning to a wider audience. After peddling some suggestions at the School of Public Health annual meeting in Gateshead, I also attended a workshop which was hosted by FUSE, this was somewhat of a matchmaking event between practitioners and academics. There I met with Liam and with the help of Peter van der Graaff and others, we were able to refine our initial proposals to focus on the interventions which coalesced under the Best Start in Life Alliance. South Tyneside is a local authority area in the northeast of England where children and families experience high levels of need and disadvantage. 
The practice members of our team worked with local people in the borough to develop a new alliancing approach to help those children and families. For the purposes of this evaluation, we have been focusing on three component interventions. These are the locality hubs, which aim to bring together different professionals that support children and families into one team and one location. Mental health champions, who are key members of staff based in any setting where young people access provision in order to provide mental health support, referrals and signposting, as well as providing colleagues with up-to-date and relevant mental health information. And then also the Young Health Ambassadors, which are an offshoot of the Mental Health Champions, and they consist of young people aged 14 to 17 who provide peer education on a variety of health and wellbeing issues, as well as advice and guidance to services about how they can make their offer more young person friendly. Our evaluation is based on realist methodology. So the first stage of the project was to conduct a realist literature synthesis. This was undertaken to identify underlying generative mechanisms associated with alliancing, the contextual conditions surrounding the implementation and operationalization of the alliancing approach mechanisms, and the outcomes produced as a result. We used both academic and grey literature sources. Three mechanistic components were identified within the data as being core to the successful implementation of alliancing in public health and social care related services within local government. These are achieving a system level approach, placing local populations at the heart of the system and creating a cultural shift. We concluded that the alliancing approach offers an opportunity to achieve system level change with the potential to benefit local populations. The synthesis has provided insights into the necessary contextual and mechanistic factors of the alliancing approach above and beyond effectiveness outcomes typically collected through more conventional evaluation methodologies. Following our realist synthesis and initial programme theory development, we conducted 12 theory gleaning interviews with key public health and healthcare practitioner stakeholders in order to refine the theories we developed. Following this, we have conducted qualitative interviews with practitioners, young people and families in order to find out their thoughts on our three component interventions of interest. We spoke to 13 mental health champions, six young health ambassadors and conducted two workshops with parents from South Tyneside. The biggest challenge we have faced is that the locality hopes have not been implemented during the course of our evaluation and in fact they are not going to be implemented in the same way in which was originally planned. So there is still going to be a similar offer within the local authority, so we decided instead to conduct workshops with parents from the borough to predict how these new hubs may or may not help families with particular reference to five key outcomes of interest, which are vulnerable children, special educational needs, income, crime and substance use and self-harm. So this is a map to represent our amended plan, which takes into consideration the lack of data availability for the locality hubs due to their delays and future changes. So specifically regarding these hubs, we are going to be using the qualitative family workshop data and available quantitative data from similar interventions elsewhere in order to forecast how these hubs may benefit families, impact upon these five key outcomes, and what the expected social return on investment may be, as well as making recommendations to the local authority on behalf of the parents that we have spoken to. In terms of dissemination, I delivered a presentation about this project to the Children and Young People's Public Health Leads, Public Health England, Northeastern Yorkshire. We also provided an update at last year's annual scientific meeting, as well as this one, of course, and at the recent Public Mental Health Symposium. Our Realist Literature Synthesis paper has recently been resubmitted to the European Journal of Public Health following reviewer comments. We will begin soon writing up our findings as per the SPHR reporting guidelines, as well as providing a summary report to South Tyneside Council. We also plan to host a research meeting for FUSE, which is the Centre for Translational Research in Public Health in the North East, and we have a further two planned academic publications one focusing on the mental health champions and young health ambassadors, and another overarching findings paper. The work of the team and the findings to date will support future developments of our services. It's also built a foundation for what's to come with the national changes and developments across the 0 to 1925 sector. The identified pillars of access and connection and relationships which are being driven by the government across the family hubs framework has already begun in earnest in South Townside. This evaluation is helping us as we prepare to understand where we are going with our identified eligibility 
to an early implementer of working in relation to the family hubs. I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank all of the participants who have taken part in the study and of course to our practice partners. Um, thank you to everyone today for listening to this presentation and please feel free to get in touch with me if you have any questions. My name is Patricia Albers. I'm a researcher at the University of Bristol. This presentation is about the first dental steps intervention feasibility study, which is an NIHR SPHR phase study. This was a collaboration between Public Health England and NHS England and Improvement, the University of Bristol and the University of Sheffield. Our public health practice partner, Rena Patel, who is a consultant in dental public health, will talk about the first dental steps intervention in the next slide. Oral health is an important aspect of general health and well-being and contributes to the development of a healthy child. However, despite being largely preventable, tooth decay is still the most common oral disease affecting children in England. First Dental Steps is an NHS E and I funded initiative embedded in the Healthy Child Programme. It is evidence based and multi stranded, consisting of oral health champion training for health visiting teams, distribution of oral health packs to high risk children, and includes a referral pathway to community dental services for children deemed at risk of developing decay. The objectives for this study were to explore the feasibility and acceptability of the intervention. We also looked at the recruitment and retention of families to the study. Data were collected at two time points, the first being the one-year development check when the family received the intervention, and then again approximately five months later. We also conducted interviews with parents, health visiting teams and other stakeholders. The intervention was delivered by health visiting teams across five local authorities in southwest England, which you can see on the map on the right. Our population included vulnerable families that were receiving their one year development check. Recruitment was fairly low across all sites except one. In total, we had 70 families consent to the study, but only 84% completed the baseline questionnaire and less than half of these completed follow up. Questionnaire data shows that more children were having their teeth brushed and drinking from a free flow or sucky beaker at follow up. This is likely due to the children getting older and progressing. Stakeholders found the intervention acceptable. They thought the advice was easy to incorporate. They thought the packs were simple and appropriate, and they liked the inclusion of the cup. Parents thought the advice was easy to understand and they appreciated the packs, but they were concerned about the cups spilling. The first few times we were using Colgate toothpaste for toddlers, they actually gave me some toothpaste with more fluoride in it. I thought there was a lot of information packed in there. It's definitely something that I can read through and make sure when my child does start getting teeth through that I can take care of them in the best way. In conclusion, the improvements identified in the study will potentially shape the rollout of the first dental steps intervention in southwest England. If you have any further questions, please do contact me. My email address is on this slide. Hi everyone, my name is Esther and I'm a research associate at the University of Bristol. Today I'm going to summarise our study evaluating the peer education project to improve mental health literacy in secondary school students. The intervention run by the Mental Health Foundation consists of four stages, from the training of staff and older students who we call peer educators, the delivering of lessons to younger students who we call peer learners, and continuing the conversation with students and schools. The lessons aim to improve students' understanding of what mental health is and where and when to seek help, as evidence suggests low mental health literacy may underpin the growing prevalence of mental health problems in adolescents. We asked a teacher currently implementing the program why mental health um, literacy is important for them. They said it's incre incredibly important as a school, we support our students to explore and understand what mental health is in a safe environment. The topic of mental health should not be seen as an add on or a one off lesson, and people should continue to have opportunities to explore and develop their own ways of looking after their well-being. What were our study aims? 
We recruited six schools in England to take part and used survey data to test ways to accurately measure mental health literacy and whether the intervention could improve mental health literacy, although we were not powered to detect change. We also conducted a realist evaluation to qualitatively explore the impact of context on the mechanisms of change. So what did we find? We measured change in six outcome variables and the numbers next to the arrows show the mean change within an individual as the students' data were matched over time. As represented by the green arrows, we, sh we saw more consistent improvements in the average intentions to seek help, the number of sources that students rated they were likely to seek help from, and their level of mental health knowledge. The confidence intervals on the right indicate how certain we are about the effect, and we are more certain when the values are closer together and when they do not span zero. Therefore, even though the variables circled looked like they increased, the confidence intervals suggest that the increases were highly variable across the sample. There was no evidence for an improvement in peer support or mental well-being, which may be because the intervention did not specifically target these. And we might expect changes to be more obvious over a longer time period, as the follow up time was as little as one week post intervention. As for the qualitative findings, after analysing 11 staff intergroup, um, interviews and 15 student focus groups, we found that certain contacts interacted with the interventions components, which we have termed resources, to affect how the participants responded to the intervention, which we have called reasoning, to then produce certain outcomes. For example, when peer learners were accustomed to didactic teaching methods, peer educators opening up about their personal experiences of help seeking led to the endorsement and destigmatization of help seeking behavior and a realization that seeking help was appropriate for them to do. To illustrate this, a student said, I talk to my parents more since the program. A staff member said it gave peer learners more of a voice to be able to speak out. And a peer educator said that it made people feel less isolated because struggles were talked about and normalized in the process. Finally, here is a snippet of our charity partner summarising the impact of our evaluation for practice. As an evidence-based organisation, it is important for our programmes here at the Mental Health Foundation to undergo external evaluations to ensure we can be confident that the intended outcomes are being achieved. The Peer Education Project was developed in 2015. Although the project has been internally evaluated year on year and was externally evaluated in 2017, it has since undergone several adaptations based on results from the previous evaluations, more recent evidence and feedback from our project schools. This evaluation conducted by the University of Bristol and Lancaster University will pinpoint the key project mechanisms supporting the refinement of the peer education project model before cascading it to more schools across the UK. Thanks for listening and please don't hesitate to contact us if you have any further questions. Hello everyone and welcome to our presentation on the Wakefield Housing Support Evaluation Project or the WHO's project. And my name is Ellie Holding and I'm a researcher from the University of Sheffield and I'm joined by my practice partner, Dave Thorpe, representing Wakefield District Housing. So we're going to talk to you today um, about our intervention, which started off at Field Head Hospital, which is a psychiatric inpatient unit that's run by South West Yorkshire Partnership NHS Trust. And the model that we had there was then followed at Penderfields Hospital, which is run by Mid Yorkshire NHS Trust. And the concept started in 2018-19 and we put in there the housing support coordinator which tested the effectiveness of working with patients who had housing related barriers to discharge um, and helping them to assist them with housing related needs. And following the support from this project and the work that we've completed and working closely with Sheffield University and we've been able to co-produce this evaluation. So um, a little bit about the study design and methods that we used in the project. So we employed a mixed methods process evaluation to understand the nature of the role and its potential impact. And there was three main strands of work that we did. 
One involved survey data collection. So we had two surveys at two time points, one on referral to the service and one approximately two months later with the same validated housing related questions so we could try and measure impact over time. We also analysed routine data collected from Wakefield District Housing, which included a number of variables, such as the different interventions that service users had. We conducted an economic evaluation to assess the cost of the intervention. And we conducted in-depth interviews with the housing support coordinators in each site, key Wakefield District Housing staff, as well as the service users and hospital staff in Fieldhead Hospital only. So a bit about the partnership that we built up within the project and a bit of context about the original application for funding, which came directly from the housing team through the public health practice evaluation scheme, which meant we had buy-in from partners from the outset. We were able to develop a strong collaboration of partners involved with the project even before the development of the funding application, which meant that we had a good mix of university, NHS housing and PPI partners sitting on either the project management or the advisory group and therefore they actively contributed to the development, delivery and management of the research. For example, PPI representatives were recruited to the project before the funding application and directly influenced the research project questions and materials. Despite the fact that we had this strong collaboration, this project experienced many challenges due to the outbreak of COVID-19, which was really starting to get going just as the project began. Of course, being a project in two local hospitals meant this had a great impact on data collection. However, as we had built up this strong partnership with mutual trust and buying from all partners, we were able to utilize the group to develop innovative solutions to overcoming these barriers. For example, after difficulties in recruiting service users for interviews in the mental health trust, we developed a strategy of recruiting them through the housing association instead. So we used our partnership to overcome these barriers, which had mutually beneficial outcomes for all the partners involved. So in terms of the project and the impacts, um, we received the main project and the economics report, and those included some recommendations for developing the intervention further, um, which we've been able to do um, in, in Wakefield and District Housing. Um, one in particular is having the housing coordinator in the field sitting with the hospital discharge team uh, and, and the person carrying out that role is now part of the integrated transfer of care team which helps to coordinate um, transfer of care and, and work into the person's home uh, more efficiently and effectively. We've also secured funding um, for, to develop a user-friendly outputs in terms of the marketing and, and dissemination of the project. Uh, and two academic papers are going to be written in co-production with the NHS as well. Um, but taking forward the next steps, we're looking to develop further housing coordinator models now. Um, one working with those with asthma and COPD and getting as far upstream as possible um, to work with those who are coming from Wakefield District housing tenancies um, to try and look and review their housing circumstances. And we're also working with the homeless cohort um, and a large number of patients within the field ed setting um, are coming from a homeless background. So we're going to try and work and develop a process to work with the homeless cohorts to develop um, a service to, to give to those customers as well. And again, looking to disseminate the Nifty Fox outputs, the softer outcomes of the project um, with some really detailed visuals that can engage um, customers within the Wakefield district. So thank you very much for listening, everyone. That was very much a whistle-stop tour of a much larger project. If you do have any questions, please feel free to email me at e.holding at sheffield.ac.uk. And we'll have the project report, which will be available on the NHR SOFA website, alongside the other outputs, such as the academic papers and the Nifty Fox output. Thank you very much for listening. Hi there, um, my name's Liam, so I am um, involved with the Best Start in Life Alliance Evaluation in South Tyneside. Um, so I'll allow my colleagues to introduce themselves as well. Hi, shall I go next? I'm uh, Liddy Goida, I'm from Sheffield and I'm uh, um, working with Ellie Holding um, on the FES evaluation that you've just seen related to um, hospital discharge. Go ahead, Patricia. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> Hi, yeah, I'm Patricia Alders, um, a senior research associate. I was working on the first dental steps evaluation, which you also just 
heard about. Yeah, and I'm Esther Curtin. I'm a research associate at the University of Bristol as well, um, working on the FES project um, that you just heard about, which is the peer um, education project run by the Mental Health Foundation, um, which is a part of a wider study team um, across um, Lancaster as well and Exeter. I see we've got a question in the chat here from Susan. Um, about the impact that COVID-19 had on our best projects uh, and what we can learn from that moving forward. Does anybody, does anybody want to go first on that? <laughs> shall, I, shall I volunteer first? Uh, just yeah. because um, inevitably, because all our um, data collection uh, and indeed the evaluation of the service was in an inpatient setting, you can imagine what was going on um, on the wards during the pandemic. It meant that we had to be incredibly flexible. And I guess my reflection from it is that um, it is often a nature of these sorts of projects that what you initially set off to do um, has to be modified um, as things change on the ground as you're working. And, you know, COVID was a great example to me of the importance of having that relationship between the partnership, between the NHS partners, the housing association partners and, and, and us as, as a research team, which meant that we kept needing to go back and say, we probably need to find a different way of collecting data because that was the main issue that um, it was hard for people to go on the wards. Um, and um, I think, you know, Ellie mentions that, you know, we had, Lord knows how many changes to the ethics application as we had to rethink it. But um, it's just a reflection, I think, of the determination to do the project. And my big learning point was that if you have a partnership where everybody involved is fully committed to the project despite covid despite you know the particularly the nhs staff involved having an awful lot else on their plate they were prepared to work with us through that and i guess another general issue with with my public health experience with these projects is sometimes things take a bit longer to get to the end point but if it's worth doing you know it's worth pursuing and this has taken us a bit a bit longer i'd, I'd acknowledge Good question. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, caused lots of good reflection. <laughs> yeah, I'll just add to that. From the first dental step side, we yeah we were impacted by COVID, so we were we needed to use health visitors to deliver the packs and the intervention to families. Obviously, at the start of COVID, they all got redeployed, so everything kind of slightly grounded to a halt. And after a few months, picked up again, and um, we needed to kind of redesign it slightly with them because a lot of their visits then had to go online and they were no longer doing those face to face. So we redesigned that a little bit with them. I think the learning from that was being able to work with the teams, redesign things and talk about what will work and what won't. And so, yeah, just a brief, briefly to add to what Lily said. I think like everybody, everyone had to kind of learn on their feet when it came to doing things digitally or virtually. Um, we, we were fortunate in that a lot of our project was qualitative. Um, so we were doing a lot of one-to-one -one interviews, which we were able to do via Zoom and Teams. Um, and then thankfully, when it came to um, doing our family workshops, the the rules had, had relaxed a bit. Um, so we were able to do those face-to-face, -face, which was fantastic because trying to uh, facilitate a focus group or a workshop online it isn't quite as straightforward as, as a one-to-one -one interview, I found in, anyway. Yeah, I can also add to that. I think, um, yeah, um, definitely some key learn learnings around um, doing research online um, from the pandemic um, is important to note. So, yeah, we did some of our focus groups and some of our um, interviews online, but then we managed to do a few of them in person as well, which was great. Um, I think also it was impacted in the fact that some of our schools implemented it extremely differently because of it being on, um, due to COVID. So school attendance was low. So sometimes the intervention wasn't carried out over five weeks. It was carried out, out over a longer period or just on one day, for example. So we have to kind of reflect on that and see 
in a future trial how how our findings from our feasibility study can translate and be generalizable out, outside of a pandemic context. Um, but yeah, all interesting learnings um, that we'll discuss with the Mental Health Foundation as well to try and um, improve for the future. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I think there's a couple more questions in the comments. So please, if you could go into them and, and answer them. Uh, thanks to Patricia, Lydia, Liam and Esther. I hope that that's given your presentations that you've just heard and the questions here have given you an insight into the, the value of that local partnership and the innovative affairs scheme and, the, and what's that created. But I think congratulations to all of the FES projects, which are, and all the projects have particularly had to adapt through COVID and you've demonstrated how you've been able to do that with great success. So thank you all um, very much. Okay, so we're now moving to the final part of our programme for today, and it gives me great pleasure to um, to um, offer welcome um, to Professor Lucy Chapel. Uh, welcome, Lucy. So uh, Lucy is Chief Scientific Advisor to the Department of Health and Social Care, and of course um, is Chief Executive of the National Institute of Health and social care research. Um, she's also a professor of obstetrics at King's College London for her day job um, and as well as other hats that she wears. So um, Lucy, you're very welcome. And I think Lucy's going to tell us a little bit about the NIHR vision and, uh, for, and uh, priorities for research funding, particularly around public health and health improvement. So thank you, Lucy, and over to you. Well, thank you very much, Ashley. And, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, working from home given the rail strikes, uh, but always, I, I think there's the bonuses of being virtual is that it often can be much more inclusive. Um, and I, I'm sure that that's been true for, for your meeting. And I'm also aware that you've got Chris Whitty and Janelle de Grucci joining you, I think. And so I'm gonna focus on some of the NIHR aspects. I would really love this to be um, interactive and to, to get some questions. So I'm going to try and keep what I'm presenting quite short and then really take an opportunity to, to address questions from this community. Um, so let me just share my uh, screen. This is where I hope that you're not necessarily going to see my emails. Give me a moment. How does that look? Hopefully that's all good. So I'm just going to reflect on a few things um, around where SPHR is going um, uh, as, you, as you head into your next quinquennium and really reflecting the very positive breadth of geography uh, that is being incorporated into your members. And this is important because we've been very clear about the levelling up agenda and how Whilst this might, on one uh, hand, look like a political slogan, it isn't for us. In NIHR, and I'm sure in SPHR, it is something that we need to live and breathe because it matters so much to public health. And if we didn't think about the levelling up agenda uh, in public health, we would have missed the point entirely. So I think this geographical uh, representation looks really positive. And also, I'm quite sure that your ambitions are not to stop at, at just here, but to go further and to really think about how, how you continue that reach over and above uh, your centres. In terms of the planning, um, this is what uh, I understand you're working on. And I just want to sort of reflect on why this is so important from the NIHR's perspective. And if I go on the right to the strategic focuses, um, what I really like about the, the research programme is, is the intersection with the strategic focuses that we have set out in best research for best health the next chapter which is a, a one-year-old now and really we're looking to how those strategic focuses are delivered through the research that you're proposing so very much about um how we come out of this phase of the pandemic we don't quite know where we're heading we're going to have other emerging infectious diseases but but thinking about how we use that recovery and reset to really address some of the the, the health disparities that were very obvious we are very clear about our ambition to build capacity and capability in, in preventative and public health, which is a, a topic close, close to all of you, but also this focus on social care research. Um, if I think of where we can make gains and really um, incremental step changes, it is going to be in those areas. There is plenty to do in health research. It's not that I'm saying that that will be 
put to one side, quite the opposite. It is time for health researchers across all areas to think about the, the population health and, and social care implications of what they do. And when I've been out and about in the last year, and I might go and talk, I was talking at UK Kidney Week a couple of weeks ago, and I challenged them to think about the, the public health and the population health aspects of kidney, kidney well-being. And it, it got some conversations going. Clearly, those with people with multiple long term conditions are something uh, that you will all be considering. And there's a couple of aspects of that. Um, thinking about the range of, of, uh, of conditions, including mental health and really how we see um, how we address the challenges of mental health, but also see an integration with with physical health. And, and for many people, they are very integrated and very interdependent. And so it's really welcome to see how you're putting that as a focus. I think this other aspect on, on uh, ensuring that we reach underserved regions and, and major health needs and, and really thinking about that through the health inequalities lens. So ensuring that um, we don't just do research where it's easy, uh, that none of us uh, come out with research projects where we've got a very high preponderance of, of one group to the exclusion of others. So I look at the NHR journals library fairly regularly to pull out examples. And sometimes I might go to a topic area and I'll, I'll choose something a little bit at random and I'll see that, uh, and you know, slightly disappointingly, the, the participants were 95% white male when that didn't reflect the underlying disease. And then I'll go to, an, to another study in the same area and I'll see that, that the, the research team, the investigators have worked hard uh, to ensure that their population are truly representative of, of, of the wider group that they are seeking to serve. So I think this, this framing of how do we all ask ourselves, are we re really reaching the population that, that most need this? And I'm sure that's something that, that uh, SPHR is, is very used to doing and is, is woven in through all of you. Um, we do want to see ED&I. My view is that um, ED&I is a virtuous circle between researchers and uh, research participants, and that is how we will continue to drive it. And that is also paired with how we look at careers for research delivery staff, but also underrepresented disciplines. So the wealth of, of disciplines across SPHR is, is very welcome. And I would ask that everyone goes out to recruit a friend who, again, may not be so familiar with the NHR, but where you know that that um, they they that could be a part of, of what they do in their life. And equally, a more challenging conversation about working with the life sciences industry. Um, but the public health researcher community have embraced these in a number of ways. And I, I, I think have been the first to recognise the challenges in this area, but doing it in an open and transparent way, um, led by people in public health research is really welcome. So I really see the overlap between your uh, research priorities and where we are in NIHR. And I think these principles of working, again, um, shown on, on the slide in the middle, but also thinking about our operating principles of, of impact, excellence, inclusion, collaboration and effectiveness are very strongly mirrored. You'll be aware of where of how we are trying to move um, in, in public health. So this is uh, the NHR Health Determinants Research Collaboration, where we were overwhelmed with with interest and application such that we are going to be running this uh, competition again um, before too long because we really recognize that many people in the community stepped up um, to recognize this as an important topic and show the join up particularly with local government so to, to new ways of working um, that we really wanted to see embedding very much beyond the usual sort of secondary care sectors so we very much hope that this is the, the first of, of many such collaborations and that we can be a part of, of funding that. I'd also like to touch on the three schools work because for me, um, I, I get to see, um, I get to approve funding requests and I am absolutely heartened by the three schools work. I think it is completely at, at the, the what we are looking for to join up across our traditional silos. And I'm sure that many of you could could um, have really thriving collaborations across this. It very much speaks to what I think is important, which is the joining up piece. And that might be at a person level. Um, we know that the NHR Academy is supporting a wider range of health and care professionals and those from a variety of backgrounds than ever before. And we always want to see how we can go further. We know that's important in terms of place. 
So reaching out geographically, and I see SPHR doing that. And also in terms of project and thinking about what those collaborations look like, and that if we're going to solve the complex problems, we need to get pe people in the room who might not have conventionally been represented, but are going to be part of the solution. So I, I see that across SPHR and very much com commend that to you going forward. So that's a very brief sort of whistle stop because I would really like to think about how we uh, so I'd like to hear from you about how we might tackle that um, and I'm very happy to take questions on that Ashley. Thank you very much, uh, Lucy, and um, thank you very much for all, all you've covered. I think a couple of just reflections there in terms of you talked about capacity and capability and recruit a friend. Um, one of the aspects that which you'll be including in the next five years is an opportunity for some transdisciplinary placements and then fellowships, and we're really excited about that. And we will be looking for help to make sure the adverts for that get to the right places and beyond the usual public health um, networks and, and so forth. I think in terms of... So, and, yeah. and, sorry, Ashley, just to say, my view is that research is for all and research is everyone's business. And in, S in SPHR, you're the converted and it's, it, there's an opportunity to go and show others the, the, the power of what you're doing and to find those and say, yeah, this is, this is you know, anyone can, can, can start on that journey. So really that's, that's, I think you've got to reach into areas that, is, that is, uh, would be really exciting to, to see more from those areas. And I think we, we, you know, we believe there's lots of people doing work that's relevant to public health and contributes to public health, but don't see themselves as exactly. being involved in public health. So it's getting, it's getting that narrative and trying to attract those people to come work together in partnership, not to leave their discipline, but to, to work to work together. So that's that will be an opportunity. I think the, you mentioned about underserved regions and communities, and I think this is something that we've been working very hard to do. And uh, you've uh, seen some examples of that, and particularly including the voices of the public um, from from different from different communities. So we've had some really good examples of presentations um, from from that. Um, I, th I think um, the other is in terms of EDI, and this is something that we, um, we, 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 we do, we've been doing some work on, but need to do much more on um, across this five years, and we'll be, and we'll be doing that. There's a, we've got, I've got one question here for you in terms of the FES scheme, which you might have yep. just heard some presentations on, and maybe some reflections on that, and obviously, um, and NIHR is now uh, commissioned first, and four teams, and now and now some more. What do you think we should be doing in terms of um, our fair scheme, so we don't duplicate first? Well, yeah. thank you, Susan, for that question. I mean, I think I'm going to slightly turn that back in that I think you are the experts, and I think I um, I've learned to un to respect the experts in their field as knowing probably far more than I do about the opportunities and the challenges. It's, it's fair to say that NIHR is, is, is what I politely call a multi-headed hydra and that we it is really good if we keep on inventing schemes, but we must also think about how we make it easy to navigate and easy to understand what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So I would say SPHR is actually in, in the best place to say, where are you seeing gaps that, that that do need to be filled and where we should be building capacity or building opportunities and projects or, or wh whichever way it might be? But how do we harmonize that and make it easy to navigate? So rather than do a sort of top down, I'm going to tell you how it is. I think that this community needs to work that out and then I'm, I'm almost what I want to communicate is to give this community permission to do what's best for them and and to, to own it themselves, because I think that the expertise lies in the in the group here, not in me in a good way. Uh, you know, not I, I can take decisions, but I would much rather hear from those who are at the coalface as to, and or or at an SPHR level to say this is working, but this this was too much overlap. Ashley, does, is that a fair way to respond? It, 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 it is, absolutely. And I think, you know, we've been thinking this through and it, one option would be to not do it, not to do FES again, but, excuse me, 
the value that it's brought, I think, is is seen in the evolution of the first. So uh, our thought is that the gap for, for for first is that actually with the third sector, voluntary sector organisations, and that might be something where we can focus to build capacity um, and partnership and extend our partnership in that in that way. So I think that probably will be the the direction that we will that we will be heading um, on on that. Um, and, and within some of that, they will be opportunities for placements for our PhD students and our fellows, both working in local authorities, but also within charities and, and, and voluntary sector, because that means that we get people with insights in how, how it works in, out there yeah. that they can build into, into their research. And, and those bridge, that bridge building activity is, is crucial. And I think it's also very much... Um, the, the essential part of, of addressing the health disparities. If we don't build those bridges, we'll carry on serving a much narrower part of society. And actually what we want to do is to reach reach all. Okay. Thank you. And we're, we're all out on tender hooks waiting for the health disparities wide paper. So Indeed. And, yeah, I think it was yes. the, we talked about that a little earlier today. Yes. Um, and um, we're, we're, we're looking forward to that and looking at how we can respond. So I think it's a real opportunity. Um, I think it will be coming out reasonably soon. And I think it's going to be, when you start with the white paper, it's how, it's what we all do with it that, that's going to count. And the fact that we've got one matched with the levelling up, matched with the other smoking reviews and, and other areas, tells us that we've we've really, we should capitalise on every, um, every call to arms to the public health community to, to, to shift on this. Um, and so, it, that is an, this is a, a time for growth that we must lean into. Okay. That's, th thank you. Thank you, Lucy. And uh, I think we've got more on our, prog our program going forward uh, tomorrow. Um, but I, I know that you're on a bit of a, a, a schedule here. So I think what, what I would like to do is, first of all, just mention you, you highlighted the three school work. And that really has been an opportunity. We've got people through our school uh, as fellows coming off some of our our fellowship programs um, and um, and also being able to work with primary care and with uh, social care across the, across that piece so um, I know we've just got um, it's a little bit further funding in, uh, in dementia uh, which is just announced last night so people won't necessarily have heard of, heard of yes. heard that just yet but we'll be sharing that news later and that's yes exciting. And, and when I reviewed those it absolutely filled me with with hope and joy that, that that join up was happening in a way that actually I think you're ahead of the game on this uh, oh. those connections that that yeah, for, perhaps for those from sort of more conventional secondary care specialties um, is I, th I think you are definitely ahead and can capitalize on that it very much more reflects both a patient journey or a, a member of the public's journey and also the changing demographics so we are seeing people live with more multiple long-term conditions and and if we carry on just addressing them in a siloed way we, we we're not going to solve you know those challenges so i think seeing that join up and um thinking about both both how you do how you do that join up in a number of ways um would be is is really welcome thank you lucy i think finishing on a, a note of being ahead of the game not being complacent and maintaining being head of the game is a is a is a is a is a good place to, to, to close Lovely. So one other thing, Ashley, I am aware that sometimes there are challenges. I'm making it sound all, all you know, and I, I know the great work that SPHR is doing. So there are th are things like excess treatment costs or in a different concept. I am always happy to hear back as, as to what when we move into new areas, what what becomes the sticking points? And and uh, so all sorts of things I may get asked about, are your schemes open to you know this group? And, and we constantly uh, review that and try and evolve our schemes so that we are inclusive. And, and, and the public health research community is a really good area where we need to constantly update uh, what we are offering to make it inclusive. So if people have got ideas about where, where there are sticking points, funnel them through Ashley or the, the school so that we, we address them. And ditto with Brian Ferguson, who, who again is very much, um, uh, you know, we're, all of us are working to try and, and, and smooth out those, those bumps in the road. Uh, so, so, sort of, so that we can do the research that we, that we want to do and that, that the research that matters. 
thank you, uh, Lucy. It's good to know that you're there to to listen to, and we'll we'll make sure we can coordinate that and, and feed and feed those to you. And I know things are are are, cha are changing in a positive way, but challenges do re do remain. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you all. Thank you very much, Lucy, and um, and thank you all for um, attending today. Um, that's the close of the formal part of today today um, and we can look forward to uh, tomorrow where um, we'll uh, be opening with the capacity building aspect of, of the of the school of public health research uh, chaired by professor rona campbell so we'll look forward to welcoming um rona and and also walter D dillo first thing in the morning um and our fellows phd students um in in that showcase before we move on to talk about the next uh, five years of the school which lucy's just given you a, a, a small snippet um of, of what's of what's to come the the expo platform will remain open um throughout now until the end of the meeting uh, the networking will be open for a little while too um so please do take opportunity if you've had your appetite whetted by some of these pro um, presentations today go in and have a look at what else is there in terms of our research programs our research themes um and also uh, our fairs program and and our, and our fellows um contributions so look forward to seeing you all uh, tomorrow um, for, for for more. But meanwhile, have a um, a restful and restful evening. Um, and I'm very sorry that we're not all sharing um, a, a, a reception together. But maybe maybe next maybe next year. Okay. So look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Bye bye.